Good morning. Welcome to First Light. It is Tuesday, September 15th, and today we're finishing up the book of Nehemiah. I'd like to set up this last chapter for you so that you'll see the the gut punch that this chap this book ends with. So we began with Nehemiah in chapter one. Uh, he is in Babylon. He's part of the people who are still living there. He was not part of the first wave of people who came back under the leadership of Ezra. He's part of the second wave. So he's a servant to the king. The king notices that he's sad and wants to know what's going on. And that opens up the door for him to tell him that things are bad back in his his home country, Israel. And so uh, the king is thinking about in chapter 2, uh, sending him back. And the king asks him, a very key question in chapter 2, verse 6. Then the king, with the queen sitting beside him, asked me, how long will your journey take? And when will you get back? So the king was not permanently releasing him. He was giving him on loan to go and work in Jerusalem and help restore Um, a sense of order that they needed, especially in the rebuilding of the temple wall. So now let's go to the last chapter. Let's go to Nehemiah chapter 13. We're going to jump a little bit ahead and look at verse 6. Verse 6 says these words, but while all this was going on, we'll talk about that in a minute, I was not in Jerusalem. For in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I had returned to the king. So he's been gone 12 years, as it turns out. From the 20th year of the king to the 32nd year, he's been in Israel. And so I want you to know, first and foremost, right from the the beginning, is that Nehemiah has kept his word. He's kept his promise. How easy would it have been for him to just stay, but he didn't. He returned to the king just like he promised. And while he's away, the whole place falls apart. It is astounding, friends. Let me remind you where we've been in the last couple of days. Remember that God's people had begun to read and hear the law of God. They were convicted in their hearts that they were not following the law of God, that they were doing wrong things. They repented In chapter 9, they made a covenant in chapter 10 with God. And in chapter 10, there were several elements of the covenant that they made. And I want to just highlight those for you and just remind you of them. First of all, they promised that they would quit this intermarrying part, that they would separate themselves from foreign peoples but especially not marrying foreign women. And remember, it's, it's not a racial issue. It's a, it's a religion issue um, because these people ha- did not follow the Lord God and had detestable practices. Uh, another thing that they were doing wrong, uh, first of all, the, the part about um, marriages and all that, that is in chapter 10, verse 30. We will not give our sons in marriage to uh, the foreign daughters. And then in verse 31, chapter 10, verse 31, we promise to obey the Sabbath laws. We promise to do that, God. We are committed to making this happen. And then the larger part of chapter 10 is about offerings and bringing those properly before the Lord. And those were offerings ultimately to God and and also to serve as the source of income for the Levites for and, and the priests to, because they were not allowed to own land and to farm. They were to live off of the offerings of God's people. That was all part of their covenant that they made in chapter 10. And the last words of chapter 10, the last words are, we will not neglect the house of God. We won't do it. We're going to live up to our responsibilities to provide for offerings and sacrifices and the payment of our tithes. We will, we are committed to doing that. And so then you've got this interlude in chapter 11 of some people who are moving back, a record of their names. We've got the dedication of the wall in chapter 12. And so at the end of chapter 12, Nehemiah is finished. 
He accomplished what he came to do. And so he returns back. He returns back to the king of Babylon, who is also the king of Persia, because Persia conquered Babylon. So now we get to chapter 13, verse 1, which we know from verse 6, all of this happening in verse 1 is when Nehemiah is gone. Chapter 13, verse 1. On that day, the book of the law of Moses was read aloud in the hearing of the people, and there it was found written that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever be ad admitted into the assembly of God because they had not met the Israelites with food and water, but had hired Balaam. You can look up Balaam. That's in the book of Numbers. Balaam was a prophet of God who was bribed to curse God's people. And the Moabite people did this. And uh, But God ended up bringing a blessing out of it instead. But it was awful. It was bad. So the Israelites uh, had not met the Israelites with food and water, but had hired Balaam to call down a curse on them. Our God, however, turned the curse into a blessing. And when the people heard this law, the people now, they excluded from Israel all who were of foreign, of foreign descent. But before this, okay, before they read this law, Eliashib, the priest, and by the way, he's actually the high priest, so he is a priest. We're going to see a little bit later, he's actually the high priest. Unless there's more than one Eliashib, one is the high priest and one isn't, I kind of doubt it. I think this guy is the high priest. Eliashib, the high priest had been put in charge of the storerooms of the house of God. He was closely associated with Tobiah. Tobiah, the Ammonite. Let's just, let's just go back, can we? I mean, you, you just need to see this again. Go back to chapter 2. Nehemiah has gotten approval from the king of Persia, who runs Babylon, to leave Babylon and now come back to Israel. And as soon as he walks in the door, he, re he, he meets opposition. And the opposition is in Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 10. When Sanballat, the Horonite, so he's a pagan, and Tobiah, the Ammonite heard about this, they were very much disturbed that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. And these guys are like a bad rash. They just won't go away. They run all the way through the book of Nehemiah, constantly causing trouble, constantly stirring things up, constantly insulting, constantly hindering the work of God. And now we get to chapter 13, and we find out that one of the priests closely associated with Tobiah, he had in verse 5 provided Tobiah with a large, notice the word large, room formerly used to store the grain offerings and incense and temple articles and also the tithes of grain, the new wine and the oil prescribed for the Levites singers and gatekeepers, as well as the con contributions for the priests. Friends, this is where offerings were stored. And these offerings happened to be the life salaries, as it were, of the priests and the Levites. This is where they were fed and where their families were provided from, out of this very storeroom. They emptied that storeroom. They moved all that those offerings somewhere else. We're not told where. They moved it somewhere else, and Tobiah is now using it as a home. He's living there. Where is this, by the way? It's in one of the storerooms of the house of God. He is in one of the storage rooms connected to this holy temple, and he's a pagan. He's an Ammonite. What's he even doing there? He is defiling the place. 
Verse 6, but while all this was going on, I was away. I was not in Jerusalem. For in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I had returned to the king. Sometime later, I asked permission of the king, and, to, and I came back to Jerusalem. Here I learned about the evil thing Eliashib had done in providing Tobiah a room in the courts of the house of God. I was greatly displeased and threw all of Tobiah's household goods out of the room. I gave orders to purify the rooms. He took all of Sanballat's stuff and put it out in the yard. And then I put back into the storeroom the equipment that belonged in the house of God, the grain offerings and the incense. Now, friends, that's bad. But we've only just begun. Because there are four things wrong when Nehemiah was gone. The first one is that Tobiah weaseled his way into a position of power and influence right there in the, this brand new temple that they had built for God. The second thing that happened is in verse 10. I also learned that the portions assigned to the Levites had not been given to them. So they let's put it in modern terms. They quit paying the salaries of the Levites. They didn't give them the oil. They didn't give them food. They didn't give them the, the, what they needed to survive on. So if you're a Levite and you're not getting paid, what do you do? And notice what it says. I, I also learned that the portions assigned to the Levites had not been given to them and that all the Levites and the singers responsible for the service had gone back to their own fields. The Levites are back to are, are now farming and they were never supposed to be doing that. They were supposed to live off the offerings of God's people. So because God's people had fallen down on their responsibilities, this had directly affected the Levites and the priests. And so I rebuked the officials in verse 11, and I asked them, why is the house of God neglected? Did you notice the choice of words? Why is the house of God neglected? Chapter 10, the very last words, we will not, we promise, we covenant, we will not neglect the house of God. And here they're already doing it. We kind of call this backsliding, friends. They've turned their back on their covenant with God after a short time. All Judah brought the tithes of grain, the new wine, the oil, into the storerooms. And then I put some people, and it gives their names, in charge. And these were responsible people. And they were, resp they were considered trustworthy in verse 13. They were made responsible for distributing the supplies to their brothers. So he not only brought all the offerings back to that storeroom after kicking Tobiah out, but he put somebody responsible in charge of distributing and paying the salaries and meeting the needs of the Levites and the priests. Remember me for this, O oh my God, and do not blot out what I have so faithfully done for the house of my God and its services. We're not finished yet, because now we get to the third thing, verse 15. In those days, I saw men in Judah treading wine presses. They're stomping on grapes. They're treading wine presses on the Sabbath day. And I saw men bringing in grain and loading it on donkeys together with wine and grapes and figs and all other kinds of loads. And they were bringing all this to Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. And therefore I warned them against selling food on that day. Men from Tyre, pagans who lived in other towns, who lived in Jerusalem were bringing in fish and all kinds of merchandise and selling them in Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. That's exactly what they stopped doing before in chapter 10. So verse 17, I rebuked the nobles of Judah and I said to them, what is this wicked thing that you're doing? Desecrating the Sabbath day. Didn't your forefathers 
do the same things so that God brought all this calamity upon us and upon this city? He's reminding them God judged us for doing stuff like this. And you're going to do it again? Now you're stirring up more wrath against Israel by desecrating the Sabbath. So they've desecrated the temple by putting an Ammonite in there, and now they've desecrated the Sabbath day. And so he he took matters into his own hands. I'll skip it, skipping a couple of verses in verse 19. He appointed some people to sit at the gates, and on the Sabbath day, they were to shut those gates, they were to lock them, and nobody went in or out. And there were some foreigners who came to bring goods and they got stuck at the gate. They couldn't get in. And and Nehemiah mocks them. What you camping out here for? Nothing's happening on the Sabbath day anymore. Y'all might as well go home. We're not finished yet. Because then we get to verse 23. Moreover, in those days, I saw men of Judah who had married women from Ashdod. Those are Philistines. Ammon, Ammonites. And Moab, Moabites. Half of their children spoke the language of Ashdod or the language of one of the other peoples and did not know how to speak the language of Judah. Friends, see, this is not a racial issue. It's a religion issue. It's a faith issue. God had a provision, as I've told you before, for foreigners to come into the people of God and become Jews. The problem is, is when people marry into the family of God and they don't become part of the people of God. And so a Jewish man marries a Philistine woman from Ashdod and they have babies. And the wife never learns how to speak um, Hebrew or Aramaic, the languages of the people, and their children speak Philistine at home. Now think about this. Process this with me. Think about it, friends. Use common sense. Read between the lines with common sense that God gave you something that's not written in the Scripture. Think about it. We're told in the Scripture that the children did not know the language of God's people. They didn't know Hebrew and Aramaic, right? But if their daddy is Hebrew... If their daddy speaks Hebrew and Aramaic and the children don't, do you honestly think for one minute that a father will never communicate with his children? Now, some dads are distant enough. Maybe they would, but not a loving dad. So you know what that means? Read between the lines. Process it with common sense. It means the dads had to learn to speak Philistine in order to talk to his children. This is exactly why God said, don't you marry these foreign women because you bring all that foreign faith into a family and that will ultimately lead you away from God. And so Nehemiah is a pretty severe leader. He rebuked them. He called down curses on them. In verse 25, he beat some of them. He made them take an oath to before God, which they had already taken an oath back in chapter 10. You shall, are not to give your daughters in marriage to their sons, nor are you to take their daughters in marriage for your sons or for yourselves. Was it not because of marriages like these that Solomon, king of Israel, sinned? I'm telling you, Nehemiah constantly appeals to the past. Remember, Solomon started out as a great king, the son of David. He was a great king. He built the first temple. And then after God rewarded him and he became faithful and he became rich and powerful, then he went off the deep end and he became one of the worst kings that Israel had ever had. And he married a thousand foreign women and they turned his heart away from God. You can look that up in King, in the book of Kings, in in that section of the Bible. And so Nehemiah is just reminding them about this. And so then, verse 27, we must hear now that you too are doing all this after we knew about Solomon. Now you're doing it? Wow. Wait a second. Verse 28. 
one of the sons, this is a lineage. You got to think family. I, I drew this out. One of the sons of Joyada, son of Eliashib, the high priest, was son-in-law to Sanballat the Horonite. And I drove him away from me. Now, Wait a second. You gotta, you, let, let's start it backwards the way we think, not the Jewish way that this is written. Let's start at the top. Eliashib, he may be a different Eliashib from the one who gave a storage room to Tobiah the Ammonite, but I don't think it is. I think it's the same guy. Eliashib the high priest has a son. So his son is a priest, right? His son's name is Joyada. And Joyada married a Horonite woman, a pagan woman. And he is the son of the high priest. And lo and behold, who is this woman's daddy? Sanballat. As in Sanballat and Tobiah, these people who are constantly making trouble for the people of Israel and for Nehemiah. Good grief. I even wrote that in my Bible. Good grief. I wrote that in the margin. <laughs> the, the son of the high priest married the daughter of Sanballat the Horonite. And so Nehemiah, the governor, he drove the high priest's son out of there. He banished him, as it were. Remember them, oh my God, because they have defiled the priestly office. So they defiled the temple, they defiled the Sabbath day, they defiled their marriages, and now they have defiled the priestly office. And so in verse 30, I purified the priests and the Levites of everything foreign and assigned them duties each to his own task. I also made provision for the contributions of wood at the designated times and for the first fruits. He reestablished all these offerings again. Remember me with favor, O oh my God. And the book ends there. Now, friends, there's a, there's a couple of major lessons here before we leave Nehemiah. The first one is, the first one is, that your spiritual condition is only measured by today. By today. There are way too many people who measure their spiritual condition by what happened last year. Man, last year I was at this revival and, ooh, man, ooh, the Holy Ghost came on me. And I say, wonderful, praise God. I love it when, when good things happen at revival meetings. But how's your walk today? I, I met a guy who, uh, who was a drunk. Uh, he was leading the most awful pagan life. He was in a hospital and he was dying. And I just asked him about his relationship with God. This was probably, let's see, this event happened um, in the 1990s. And this is what he told me. This guy, this older gentleman is laying in bed, and I'm asking him about his, rela his relationship with God. It's a present tense question because he's dying, and he may be about to meet God. And I'm being gentle and loving. I'm being passionate now telling you the story. But I, but I was gentle and loving when I'm listening and I asked him about his relationship with God, and his answer was that back in 1971, he got baptized. Friends, hear me. Your spiritual condition is only measured by today. I don't care how great, I don't care how wonderful your past was. If you're backsliding today, then you're backslidden, and you need to get right with God. David was a man after God's own heart. No one has ever had that acclamation from God in the whole Bible. But the day that he lusted after Bathsheba, had one of his servants fetch her, and then slept with her and committed adultery, he was no longer at that moment the man that he had been after God's own heart. Your spiritual condition 
is measured by today. And if we need to get right with God, friends, don't wait. Do it today. Do it right now. There's a second major lesson. Remember what we, we're finishing this study. Today is the end. We've spent uh, several weeks now covering four books of the Bible. We've looked at Ezra, Nehemiah, Haggai, and Zechariah. All these books happen at the same time. And we've, we've undertaken a study of the restoration period of God's people. And that's what we have been witnessing. It's been a roller coaster ride, hadn't it? But friends, God has been restoring his people. The sin before they were attacked by the Babylonians and carried off into captivity, their sin was horrible. It was awful. Sexual sins. They lied. They steal. Um, God told Jeremiah, go to the marketplace and see if you can find one person who told the truth. Just one. Just one. Constant idolatry. Sin after sin after sin. And then they get attacked. They're carried off into Babylon. And after 70 years, they come back. And they still have some rough edges, don't they? But did you notice one thing that is not mentioned anywhere in what we have read in the, these four books? Idol worship. Idol worship is gone. When Jesus came about 400 years later, a little more than that, when Jesus walked into Israel 400 or so years later, idol worship as a part of Jewish culture was gone. Now, they had a lot of other problems, uh, but idol worship was gone. Something that had been a part of God's people from the beginning has finally been weeded out of them. And so, friends, God has indeed restored them. He's done a great work in their lives. They've still got some rough edges. Their, their faithfulness to understanding the importance of marrying within their faith, their, the importance of offerings, the importance of providing for God's house, they're still struggling with all. They're stumbling. Two steps forward, one step back. But God has kept his promise to restore them. And friends, if he'll do that for these people, he will do that for you. If you're backslidden today, if you are not where you need to be, God can restore you, friends. That is the power of the grace of God. It's the power of the blood of Jesus. It is the power of the work of God in the human heart through the work of the Holy Spirit to bring healing and deliverance to those who will say yes to Jesus. Be free. Live for Jesus. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, this has been a powerful study. And I thank you so much for the record of these words. And there's been some high moments and we've looked at some low moments. But through it all, you have, you have shown yourself to be faithful. You have shown yourself to be merciful. And you have shown yourself to draw people constantly to yourself. And to those who say yes, they experience transformation. Continue that work, Lord. Even if there's someone right now under the sound of my voice, Lord, oh Jesus, I know that you're only a prayer away. Someone may need to, to really come to you for the first time. Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. I understand that I'm broken, and I believe that you died on the cross for me. Come into my life and forgive me. Lord, I want to be yours. And Jesus, I know that you can transform anybody who prays something like that. Be king. Be Lord. Not just in word, but in reality of our lives as well. For we pray this rejoicing in the victorious name of Jesus, our King and our Redeemer. And all God's people said, Amen and Amen. I'll see you tomorrow with a new study. This is First Light.